In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Considering that the 40 days of the fast are nearly over, and we are coming upon Great and Holy Week, wherein our prayers and our fasting are intensified in order for us to uh, follow along in soul with our Lord and Savior through his passion, death, and resurrection. Um, I felt that this reading on fasting from the field, Cultivating Salvation by St. Ignatius Ryanchaninov, uh, was fitting. On Fasting from Chapter 19. The greatest of virtues is prayer. The foundation of prayer is fasting. Fasting is, is the constant moderation in eating along with wise discernment. Proud man, you imagine so much, you think so highly of your own mind, but it, it is in constant and complete dependence on your stomach. The law of fasting, which is externally a law for the stomach, is in essence a law for the mind. If the mind, the crown of man, wishes to enter and preserve its proper dominion, it must first submit itself to the law of fasting. Only then will it be constantly awake and illumined. Only then can the mind rule over the desire of the heart and body. Only through constant temperance can it learn the commandments of the gospel and follow them. The foundation of virtues is fasting. The newly created man, when he was given Eden, was also given one single commandment, the commandment to fast. Of course, only one was given because it was enough to preserve the first man in his sinlessness. The commandment did not speak about the quantity of food, but only forbade a quality, a type of food. May those who believe that fasting refers only to the quantity, not quality, be silent. If they were to fully immerse themselves in the study of fasting, they would see the importance of the quality of the food they eat. The commandment to fast, pronounced by God to man in Eden, was so important that it was accompanied with a warning that man would be punished if he broke the commandment. The punishment was eternal death. And even today, sinful death continues to strike down those who break the holy commandment to fast. Those who do not preserve moderation and the necessary discernment in food can preserve neither virginity nor chastity. They cannot rein in anger. They fall prey to laziness, depression, and sadness, and they become the slaves of vanity, the home of pride, all of which lead the person into a carnal state that is most obviously revealed in his luxurious and overflowing table. The commandment to fast is renewed or even confirmed by the Gospels. But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly, said the Lord. Overeating and drunkenness not only make the body weak, but also the mind and heart. In other words, they lead the person both in his soul and body into a carnal state. Fasting, on the contrary, excuse me, on the contrary, leads a Christian into a spiritual state. He who is cleansed by fasting is contrite in his spirit, chaste, humble, silent, and refined in the emotions of the heart and thoughts, light in his body, capable of spiritual labors and contemplation, and capable of accepting the grace of God. The carnal man is completely submerged in sinful pleasures. He is sensual in his body, in his heart, in his mind. He is incapable not only of spiritual joy and accepting God's grace, but he cannot even repent. He is incapable of any spiritual work. He is nailed to the earth. He is drowned in a sea of possessions that have no life. While still alive, he is dead in his soul. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Such is the word of God to those who disregard the holy commandment to fast. What will satisfy you in eternity, when here on earth you have learned only to be sated by perishable food and worldly enjoyments, none of which exist in heaven? What will you eat in eternity, when you have never even tasted a single heavenly food? How can you eat and enjoy heavenly food, when you have never appreciated it, even despised it on earth? The daily bread of a Christian is Christ himself. Insatiable satiety from this bread is salvific sanctification and joy, to which every Christian is called. We are called to insatiably fill ourselves with, this, with the word of God, to insatiably fill ourselves with the commandments of Christ, to insatiably fill ourselves with the food of the Lord. Thou hast prepared a table before me against them that trouble me. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and thy cup that inebriateth me. How strong it is! Where shall we begin, says St. Macarius the Great? We who have never studied our own hearts, 
standing without, let us knock on the door through prayer and fasting, as the Lord himself commanded us. Knock, and it will be opened to you. This labor which is offered to us by one of the greatest teachers of the monastic life was a labor of the holy apostles. Through it they were granted to hear the words of the Spirit. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. From this labor in which they combined prayer and fasting, they heard the command of the Spirit to include the Gentiles in their missionary endeavors. What a marvelous union is achieved by fasting and prayer. Prayer is without effect if not established on fasting, and fasting is fruitless if prayer is not created from it. Fasting releases a person from passions of the flesh, while prayer battles against spiritual passions, and having defeated them enters the very fabric of the person, cleanses him from within, and leads God into this cleansed, rational temple. Whoever begins to sow the land without first clearing it destroys the seeds before they can even sprout, and instead of wheat he reaps thorns. If we sow the seeds of prayer in a similar manner, we will reap nothing, but we will harvest sin instead of truth. Prayer will be destroyed and dissipated by various vain and sinful thoughts and imaginings. Our feelings will be def defiled by sensuality. Our flesh has come from the earth, and if we do not clear it as we would a field, we will never be able to grow the, fir the fruit of truth. However, if someone works the land with great effort and labor, but leaves it unsown, then it will be completely covered in weeds, thus when the body is mortified by fasting, but the soul is not cultivated by prayer, reading, and humble-mindedness, then fasting becomes the source of many spiritual passions, vanity, arrogance, contempt. What is the passion of, of overeating and drunkenness? It is, the natural, it is the natural desire for food and drink that has lost its proper orientation, which demands a great deal more in quantity and variety that is necessary for the support of life and physical strength. Ironically, this excess acts in the opposite way on physical strength, becoming harmful, weakening, and even destroying the body in its strength. Desire for food is sated by simple food, and from overeating and excessively enjoying food by abstinence. At first, one must reject satiety and gluttony. Through this, the desire for food is reoriented according to its natural purpose. When this hunger becomes properly directed, then a person becomes satisfied with simple food. On the contrary, the desire for food that is satisfied with overeating and gluttony becomes blunted. In order to, in order to reawaken it, we invent various de delicious foods and drinks. At first our hunger seems to be satisfied, but it gets more and more picky, and finally it becomes a sickening passion that constantly seeks satiety and satisfaction, yet always remains unsatisfied. If we, have decided to, if we have decided to dedicate ourselves to the service of God, let us put fasting as the foundation of our labors. The essential quality of any foundation must be unbreakable firmness, otherwise a building will never remain standing, even if it is built properly. And we must not under any circumstances allow ourselves to break a fast through satiety, especially through drinking too much. The Holy Fathers generally consider the best fast to be eating once a day, but not to complete satiety. Such a fast does not weaken the body because of long abstinence, yet does not burden it with excessive food, and still makes it capable of soul-saving activity. Such a fast is not particularly difficult, and so the one fasting has no reason to think highly of himself, something he would be inclined to do if, he, if his fasting was out of the ordinary. Whoever does physical work or is so weak bodily that he cannot be satisfied with only one meal a day can eat twice daily. The fast is for the person, not the person for the fast. But in any case, whether you eat often or rarely, eating until you are full is strictly forbidden. This only makes a person incapable of spiritual labors and opens a door to other carnal passions. But immoderate fasting, that is, prolonged excessive abstinence from food, is not recommended by the Holy Fathers. A person also becomes incapable of spiritual labor when his body is weakened through excessive abstinence, and often his fasting is soon followed by gluttony, or he falls into the passions of pride and vanity. The quality of food is extremely important. The forbidden fruit in Eden was pleasing to the eye and taste, but it acted poisonously on the soul by giving the premature knowledge of good and evil, thereby destroying the purity in which our holy fathers, our holy, our, excuse me, our forefathers were created. And today, food continues to act strongly on our soul, which is especially evident when one drinks wine. 
Thus, all alcoholic drinks, especially those made from wheat, are forbidden to the ascetic laborer, since they rob his mind of temperance and make him incapable of the invisible war with the thoughts. The defeated mind, especially the victim of sensual thoughts, is deprived of spiritual grace. That which has been carefully acquired through many long labors is lost over the course of a few hours and even a few minutes. A monk should not drink wine, said St. Piman the Great in the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Every pious Christian who desires to preserve his virginity and chastity should follow this rule also. The Holy Fathers followed it, and even if they did drink wine, it was very rare and in great moderation. Spicy food should be removed from the table of the ascetic, since it awakens carnal passions. Such foods include pepper, ginger, and other sweets. The most natural food is the one that allotted that was allotted to man immediately after his creation, fruit from the plant kingdom. God said to our forefather, and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Only after the flood was meat allowed for food. A vegetarian diet is best for the ascetic. It warms the blood the least, fattens the body the least, and its constituent parts affect the brain the least. And finally, it is the healthiest kind of food. For these reasons, one who follows it mostly easily, most easily preserves his purity and watchfulness of mind and its ability to rule over the body of the person. The passions have less hold over the body, and the person is more able to dedicate himself to ascetic labors. Fish dishes, especially those prepared from large sea fish, have a completely different quality. They have a palpable effect on the mind, they fatten the body, they inflame the blood, and they fill the stomach to satiety, especially when eaten often and in large quantities. These effects are greatly magnified when eating meat. Meat fattens the body excessively, giving it an especial laziness, and inflames the blood. It has a deadening effect on the brain, and for this reason monks must never eat meat. It belongs to people who live in the world, who are constantly burdened by heavy physical work. But even for them, constant eating of meat is harmful. So... I can hear the so-called know-it-alls saying, Meat is allowed by God, and you dare forbid it? To this I answer with the words of the Apostle, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. We refuse to eat meat not because we consider it to be unclean, but because it has a deadening effect on our entire body and mind, which hinders our spiritual development. The Holy Church in its wisdom has established that Christians living in the world can partake of meat, but not constantly. Periods of meat eating are separated by times of abstinence from meat, times during which the Christian cleanses himself from the meat in his system. Such a beneficial effect of fasting is evident to anyone who keeps the fast. It is absolutely forbidden for monks to eat meat. They are only allowed to eat dairy and eggs during the non-fasting periods. On certain days and time, period, time periods, they are also allowed to eat fish, but... The majority of the time they are allowed only plant foods. Such a diet is almost exclusively used by the most zealous ascetics, especially those who, are all, who already feel the grace of the Spirit of God, for reasons of its beneficial effect on the body and its low cost. They limit, they limit themselves to drinking water, not only avoiding alcoholic drinks, but also rich ones such as kvass and all other wheat-based drinks. The rulers of fasting, the rules of fasting are established by the church with the purpose of helping its children as a guide for the entire Christian society. In addition to this, it is recommended that every Christian seek the advice of an experienced and discerning spiritual father and not decide by himself to fast beyond his abilities. Again, I repeat that the fast is for the person, not the person for the fast. The food that is given for the support of the person must not become the source of his destruction. If you curb your stomach, said St. Basil the Great, you will enter heaven. If you will not, you will be the victim of death. By heaven he means a grace-filled, prayerful state. By death he means a passionate state. A grace-filled state, while still on earth, is a promise of eternal blessedness in the heavenly Eden. Falling into sin's grasp and the soul's death is a promise of eternal suffering in the depths of hell. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.